Thank you. So I'm going to start off and thank John for joining us today. And then I'll introduce you in a second, John. We're very excited to have you join us today. Um, and for everyone joining online, thank you guys for joining. We know it's the middle of the afternoon on a Thursday and you're taking time out of your busy life and many of you are in the middle of the work day and yet you're taking the time to commit to um, growing your coaching and spending some time today with us and with John. So we highly appreciate the fact that you're doing this. A bit of logistics, so you guys all come in. We did webinar for this with the big audience, so you're muted. Um, however, there is the chat function. So if you don't use Zoom every day like I do, there's the chat function along the bottom and you can type questions as we go. This is a Q&A. So we're gonna start with some questions that we've put together for John. However, please use the chat or the questions function. So you'll also see there's a Q&A function as well. Kirsty is uh, from the Canadian Sports Center Atlantic is going to be helping me go back and forth and ensure that your questions are asked as we get into things. Um, for those I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, uh, either electronically or in person, my name is Natasha and I'm the coaching lead with the Canadian Sports Center Atlantic and we deliver all of these podium performance sessions. So if this is your first one, every month we deliver two, a daytime and a nighttime podium performance session between the months of September and April. And our goal is to give you guys, the coaches, uh, right from grassroots up to our high performance Olympic coaches, an opportunity to learn new things, grow, meet new people like John we get to meet today um, and expand your mind. So we're gonna dive into it. Um, and also you guys, if you, do want to unmute and ask your question, there is that functionality as well from our end. So just make sure you post in the chat that you want that option. So John is, is joining us today. He's an internationally known TEDx speaker and the founder of the Changing the Game project, project which many of you know, which is why you're here. Um, he started that in 2012. He's the author of two number one best-selling books, Changing the Game and Every Moment Matters and leading youth sports blogger and hosts the Way of Champions podcast, which if you haven't checked out yet, you definitely should. It's one of the top rated podcasts in the world for coaches. John's a former collegiate and professional soccer player and has coached for over 20 years in youth, high school and college level. He's consulted with the US Olympic Committee as well as a number of other US based sports as well as Ireland and uh, Aussie rules football, many more. He's a member of the National Advisory Board for the Positive Coaching Alliance and the National Association for Physical Literacy. All great things in which we want to do and be involved in. Um, so with that said, we're gonna jump over to John and uh, are you all set for me to ask you some questions? I'm ready to go, I'm all warmed up, ready to go. Okay, great. I have my fireplace in the background. I'm not so warmed up, but we're going to go anyway. <laughs> um, so we're going to launch off and I'm just going to ask you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and what's inspired you to start the Change in the Game project. Yeah, thank you. And again, uh, to echo what you said, thank you to everyone for being here and taking time out of your busy day. Um, yeah, so I was a multi-sport athlete growing up, played uh, collegiate Division One NCAA soccer at Fordham University, played pro for a while, got injured, fell into coaching on the university level, close-ish to you, University of Vermont, uh, for four years, um, and then moved to Michigan, and then I've been in Oregon for 15 years now. Um, working with an affiliate of the major league soccer team here, the Portland Timbers, in my coaching world. But uh, back in 2012, started changing the game project because I, I kind of felt like I, I was a little fed up with the politics around youth sports. Uh, I ended up writing a book for parents because I had seen so many kids on their journey and felt like, you know, parents are, are told to be great sports parents, but no one ac actually gives them the information of, well, what does that look like and how can you do it? And so the book ended up becoming a popular blog, a TED Talk, uh, as you mentioned, the Way of Champions podcast three and a half years ago now. And um, yeah, and then a second book for coaches a uh, year ago, December, uh, Every Moment Matters. And so, um, yeah, we work with lots of organizations, like you mentioned, um, doing coach education, parent education, uh, team captain and leadership development, team development for some college sports and um but mostly just trying to provide really good information for coaches and for parents who want to you, you know who understand i think in sports that with the goal is always to win but the purpose is something much deeper and much bigger than that and if we do sports right we can both win and get a lot more out of it for the human being and not just the athlete 
Yeah, and I think that's so important and the work that you've done is so important because it's one of the biggest questions we get uh, as far as sessions to deliver or questions or problems that our coaches have is, well, it's really the parents that we're trying to work with and that parent education side of things has not always been there. So um, yeah, it's just a great area to have a discussion about. Mm -hmm. Um, so through being a best-selling author, writing your blog, and having po close to 200 podcast episodes, which is a lot of talking, uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. You've been able to have conversations with many talented and influential people. What is the biggest piece of advice that you've received from those others you've spoken to? You know, sort of I, I start from a coaching perspective what do I wish someone told me when I was 25, 26 and starting coaching? And it would really be uh, know yourself, you know, self-awareness. Like, I, I think this is one of the most important things. So I think most people get into coaching at the end of their, their own playing journey or sporting journey. And if we have unfulfilled expectations, if we could have, should have, would have, made it. We, we, we carry a lot of baggage from the end of our playing career into our coaching career. And if we don't come to terms with, with that baggage, um, if we don't really come to terms with, I'm no longer the, the player, I'm the coach, and this is a different experience, um, then you know, we're not necessarily healthy ourselves. And so I really resonate with this quote from uh, Joe Ehrman is a great, he's a friend and he wrote a book called Inside Out Coaching. And he says, to be a better coach, be a better you, right? And, and, and that is where all coaching starts. And I think one of the, the biggest things that gets missed sometimes is we start coaching with the X's and O's and here's the training plans and here's the periodization and here's all the sciencey stuff. But coaching truly is about connections and relationships. And you can't have healthy relationships with your athletes until you have a healthy relationship to yourself. So I wish way back then someone sat me down and said, work on yourself and you're going to be a much better coach. Because, uh, you know, sadly, there's a few kids that I've left in my wake um, that I wasn't a great coach for. Um, right before this call, I had a one hour Zoom with a former player of mine from Vermont, a youth player who's now, you know, a school principal and stuff like that. And he likes me, thank God. Um, but talking about leadership and talking about, you know, different things and uh, what we learn on the journey. And so I think this is one of the most important things that we can get across to the coaches who that we're, we're training is, is do the inner work right? Understand interpersonal connections, understand intrapersonal knowledge, and understand your sport. And that's really the foundation of what we do. Yeah, that's perfect. And for any of you that are on the call um, that were also on our session last night, so John, we don't normally do them this close back to back, but we actually ran our December webinar last night. It was on communication. Oh, and perfect. so we touched on that as well. Yeah. So it's great to hear this message is last night we focused on how are you communicating and having self-empathy first and knowing yourself? So it's great to hear um, that you feel that that's such an important part of it. And, and, and let me just add, Natasha, because this is really important, right? We all, but because of everything we've been through in our lives, we all have default behaviors. And one of the biggest things that we do with the, the teams that we work with is say, okay, what's our default behaviors and what are the behaviors that drive success for us, drive excellence? And, and recognize that in this situation, I will default to this, which isn't necessarily always a good thing. And I need to train myself. I need to be disciplined to do this instead. Right. And so we outline the behaviors that we want to see. And this starts with me as a coach as well. Like um, I have defaults that when the referee makes a bad call, right. Or, or a player is frustrating me because they're not paying attention. I default to certain things, but that's not always healthy uh, for the athlete or for myself. And so I need to learn to train myself to do different things. And, and that's where, again, I got to know myself and, and then communicate better because I'm not just, you know, blurting out what popped into my head first, which isn't always nice. Totally. I love it. Yeah, that's a great message for all of us. 
Um, so you're seen as an advocate for keeping sport fun and keeping the play uh, in play ball. In Canada and Nova Scotia, safe sport's been a popular topic and we continue to discuss it in many different avenues. What advice do you have for these coaches in continuing keeping safe sport, um, keeping sport safe and also fun? Mm. Well, I mean, obviously, yes, we ha we ha it starts with safety, right? Uh, a safe environment, you know, from not just obviously like physical abuse, but emotional abuse and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and this, we always walk this fine line between, um, you know, pushing our athletes to, to do something that's not necessarily comfortable, but when, um, our pushing changes from being, um, demanding, which is a good thing to becoming demeaning, then it becomes an unhealthy thing and, and something that goes against safe sport. And I think it's also really important to recognize the, um, the research around this, that um, one of the key aspects when you talk about high performing cultures um, in business, in sport is psychological safety. So, so feeling that I have a voice, feeling that I have ownership, feeling that I have a say um, in, in what happens to me is one of the most important things. And so you can get results by fear in the short term, but never over the long term because it doesn't develop intrinsic motivation and things like that. So, um, so by creating this place that's safe. And I'm not talking about, again, like safe spots that no one challenges you or anything. It's not that at all. It's just that I can make mistakes and, and fail. And I feel like, oh, that's part of the process. This is a learning environment. I'm suppo That's supposed to happen. Um, and then coming back to the joy piece, because after all, it's sport and and we have to love it. And I think as adults, we can look at the things like you know, I, I, I just I spent so many years running as a soccer player. I just don't go for runs anymore. I don't like running. It's not my thing. Right. But I'll ride my mountain bike for three hours. Right. No problem. I'll hike and ski a mountain. No problem. I'll be exhausted at the end of the day and say that was the greatest thing ever. But ask me to go for a 20 minute run and I mean, stick a fork in my eye. So joy matters so much. And we realize this from our own lives that if we get joy from running or biking or lifting weights or whatever, swimming, whatever we do, we're more likely to do it more and come back. And so I think especially even if we're working in the high performance track with young kids, joy has to be at the center of it. Right. And it can't, it can be hard, it can be challenging. Right. But they still have to say at the end, man, that was hard. Can't wait to do that again. Um, and, and that's what a great coaching and a great learning environment looks like is, is that mix of joy, which is playing the game, competing um, and, and learning and demanding and all that sort of stuff that that's what, that's what people want. But when we suck the joy out of it in pursuit of, X, Y, and Z, especially with young kids, they're going to find something else that they enjoy more. Yeah. And I'm going to tie onto that and um, share with you guys and share with you, John, a short story, because I got to see this in person recently in that it wasn't even in the pursuit of excellence. My five-year-old daughter had started to lose interest in gymnastics and I was a gymnast growing up and then became a competitive snow snowboarder. And that was my path. And I found a lot of joy in that. So to see her lose interest at five in gymnastics, you start to wonder like, why isn't it fun for her? And it turns out she was bored. So mm -hmm. it was nothing to do with the pursuit of excellence. She got a new coach who challenged her and she came out of a practice where I saw her fail again and again and again. And she came upstairs and said, mom, I can't wait for next week. And I want to be in that class forever. Mm -hmm. And I thought, isn't that interesting to see that it's not always, um, you know, that she was pushed to do different things. It was that she was just simply challenged and that's the joy. And that's so, the power of a yeah. great coach right there. Yeah. Totally. Right? Yeah. That's and all that I've changed. Seen I've seen the journey with my own children, right? The things that I love to do. I love to ski or snowboard and things like that. My kids are teenagers now. And when they were young, you know, I had a lot of friends who like push their kids. Like we live 30 minutes from a ski mountain and it's like, you know, oh, every weekend we're up there over and over and over. And I never did that. I'm like, okay, we're going to go once in a while, but I'm not going to force you. Right. And there was definitely days when they did like ski lessons when they were young and the weather was horrendous and I dropped them off and be like, heck no, I'm not going up today, but they can go, you know, but, but what I found now in their teenage years is it's their journey, 
right? So they love it. So before our ski mountain opened this year, my son's like, hey, dad, can we go hike the mountain and ski it, you know, and, and stuff like that, which to me is great, right? They find biking. My daughter took up uh, river surfing this summer when everything kind of shut down. There's a surf wave in our river and it's like, I don't do that, but that's hers, you know? And, and I think this is what's really important is that we're sort of introducing them to different things and helping them find their passion and not trying to determine it for them. And then recognizing that sometimes it's better to find a great coach and their kids are going to be passionate about that um, than something that you think they should do and the coaching's terrible. Mm, definitely. I love that. And that also ties into a follow-up question I was just thinking is we get asked a lot with teenagers. So a lot of our coaches work a lot with young kids and feel very comfortable with that. And then you get into the teenage years and it can be a little harder. And we know there's such big drop off for especially our female athletes, but our male athletes as well in those teenage years. So as a parent of teenagers and someone who's coached um, that age, how do you continue to make it fun? And what's your advice for coaches working in that teenage year, in those teenage years? I think it's really making those individual connections and recognizing here that we have such a variety of sports that uh, uh, an alpine skiing coach might have a very different one-on-one -on -one connection than someone who's got 10 or 20 or 30 kids in their team or their pod of athletes. Um, and that makes it more challenging. But recognizing that um, everyone's on their own journey. And oftentimes that lack like what why is there that lack of interest what is it and trying to get at the heart of that is is super important so especially kid, teenagers right who have sort of lost their why do i play they've lost the joy and then they get injured right and it's a three months six months nine months injury a lot of those kids quit because they try to come back the rehab's hard they're behind where they were everyone else has pulled ahead and, and so that's that really important moment when, you know, as the coach, you say, okay, yeah, you know, you did your ACL and yes, the doctor said you could play again, but it doesn't mean you're ready, right? It's not seven months, it's a year minimum to get psychologically right again and, and, and get back to where you were. And so I think um, one of the biggest things that we can do is just um, recognize that. And also, I mean, there's this natural attrition at that age, right? That if you have a kid who does two sports or three sports and they really are competitive, they might need to narrow it down to one, right? And it doesn't mean that you, you I think they can leave your sport and you can still take pride in it, that you did a great job. Like there's a girl that I coached um, in, in soccer here who was a top, top Nordic skier. And, you know, she, she stuck with soccer for a while went and played a year of college soccer and then um, said, eh, you know what, I think Nordic skiing is my path and then transferred colleges and, you know, became a top Nordic skier. Um, awesome. But it's like, she still loves soccer. Right. And, and, and so we can, as a coach support that athlete in their journey um, so that, you know, just because they're leaving our sport, what we just don't want them to do is leave everything. And if, sadly, when kids quit for bad experiences, they, they quit everything and they never come back. That's what the research says. And so it's like, hey, if you need to just take up swimming and you can't balance this as well, great. That's okay. But I just want to make sure that you love this. And if I made that decision really hard for you, then I've done my job. <laughs> yeah, totally. I love that. And it ties in well to our next question. Um, and it's also so important for coaching, right? So if we lose those teenage athletes, are we ever going to get them back as coaches? And we're losing all those potential great um, coaches as well and advocates in sport. So coaches have identified to us the retention and recruitment of athletes and coaches to be a big challenge. And this is one we've continued to hear for years now. Do you have any advice on how to combat this challenge? Retention and recruitment of athletes, you know, at, at the like grassroots ages, youngest ages? Um, trying to think. I don't think at the youngest ages. Um, and I think the biggest one, let's talk about the coaches, because I do <laughs> continue to hear about that one. The struggle to uh, both recruit people into coaching. And then once you get them, how do you keep them engaged? Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a huge one, um, especially when we're working on volunteers um, and then... Yeah. And then being afraid to ask a lot of our volunteers so we don't 
you know, have them do certification or we just do, we, you know, we sort of tick the box of the lowest common denominator. And then we're like, okay, well, we're done with that. Wash our hands of it and move on. Um, but I, I don't think volunteerism, it's not an excuse for lack of professionalism. And like nothing else that we do with our kids, we, we, don't, we don't say to the lifeguard, oh, you don't really feel like doing the training? That's okay, you know? So everything else, every, everywhere our kids are from 8 a.m. till 3 p.m., teachers, daycare, all that, everyone has degrees and certifications and someone overseeing them. And then oftentimes at three o'clock, you know, we turn them over to the coach whose only qualification is, are you available? Right. And, and so this is one of our huge challenges. And, and I think one of the big myths is that if we ask more of them, they'll be even harder to get. But every organization that I've worked with that has asked more actually has great retention. So I'll give you an example. Um, I worked with a guy named Nate Baldwin and um, his uh, parks department in Wisconsin. And Nate, uh, when he took over, their, their, they had like seven years of declining participation in their rec big sports, which were soccer and flag football and basketball and baseball, softball. And so he said, we need to define our values and who we are, right? We need to really tell people, this is what you're signing up for. We're not this or we're not that. This is us. We need to educate our parents. And we need to train our coaches and we need to give them the tools to communicate and connect. And here's the practices to run, but here's how to connect with these kids. And four years later in those main programs, his numbers were up like participation, like 60, 70%, huge numbers up. But he said one of the most surprising things was that in his first year, um, he had 80 soccer teams. And he had to actively dial for dollars on 50 of, them, 50 of them. So no one volunteered to coach. And he would just go down the list calling until someone said, okay, I'll do it. Um, fast forward four years, he had 120 soccer teams and he only had to find eight coaches. So by asking them to do more, the coaches came back right? Because they felt supported. And if there was parent issues, they were supported. So I think one of the biggest things with uh, finding and retaining coaches is create a place where people want to coach, where they know they'll be given the tools and not just thrown off in the corner and, oh, thank God we got you. They'll be supported. They'll be backed up by your organization when they do get that out of line parent or whatever. Um, they, they'll have opportunities to grow as a coach. And, and then, you know, that they it's it's like oh that wasn't so bad that was great right now parents hear horror stories like why would i want to coach you know why would i want to coach seven-year-olds they all think they're going to the world cup two years from now and i'm going to volunteer my time and spend all these hours so yeah that's what i would say on that front okay i love that message yeah and i'll share with you here we uh we have been putting more and more requirements on the coaches especially in the aspects of safety so requiring them to do safe sport training and multiple other trainings but uh i hope in turn that we get to keep them as you're saying um and that they are supported for each of you that are on the call from a pso especially or from an organization i know there's many on the call who are representing full organizations right now that you're supporting your coaches so that we can keep them that's great mm -hmm. And I'll throw this out, Natasha, too, mm -hmm. for all of the people listening. Um, what I'd love to see now that we've become so good at virtual and online education, right? Ten years ago, you had to go to a workshop and take a weekend or two and do that. Now we can teach a lot of things, a lot of intro to coaching virtually. Um, so my suggestion is, since it doesn't really cost us a lot to deliver it, um, why not take our high school age athletes while they're still participating and start putting them into coach education programs, right? And make it free and say, you know, in, in soccer here, oh, hey, we're going to get you your grassroots coaching license while you're still playing that costs nothing. And maybe you don't think about that, but in 10 years you go and you have kids and then you get asked to coach and you say, huh, you know, I remember that coaching license I did. That was pretty good. That helped me out. And then I go back and do more. So we can educate our current athletes for very, very low cost and, and I think start developing the next coaches while they're still participating. 
Mm -hmm. And I think for everyone on the line, that could be our to do for everyone today, because I think this is a big key point. And um, John, it's an area we've been talking to performance coaches here. So people have made it to the national team coaching level and looking back at when did they start coaching and many of them, it was very young. So their first experiences in coaching were between the ages of 14 and 16, which is much younger than you would generally think. But those are the people who were retained. So take this message from John, everyone on the line and get the younger ones involved, because I think what you see happening is those who don't have any experience are very nervous to get involved when they're, say, a new parent in their 30s. Um, or whenever people are having children now, it's very different, but uh, they're nervous. So if they've had that experience as a young athlete and, and gotten some training, I think you, you're really on to something there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take, we have one question already from the floor. So I think mm -hmm. we'll take a quick break and jump into that one. Yeah. Um, so this is from Mohit. It's, uh, is it important to have a coach who is experienced or who like to play the sports with athletes and grow together? Read that one more time. It is, is it important to have a coach who is experienced or who like to play the sport with athletes and grow together? Hmm. Um, I, I'm, what I'm assuming, Mohit, that you're asking is that, um, is do you, do you have a, a high level of playing, participation, playing experience in that specific sport? I mean, I think certainly the higher the level that you're coaching, the more important that experience is. I think when kids are younger and it's grassroots and it's introduction to baseball, introduction to soccer, I think understanding children is far more important than understanding the sport because there's certainly plenty of sports that, um, that, you know, lend themselves to rolling out a ball and playing. I saw people on here from sailing. Well, I don't know you push someone out in a boat and say, go sail, right? They need some basic tools. So, um, I think I think it depends on the sport, but I also think you know it's really interesting this this conversation that I had this morning with um, one of my former soccer players. He was a very good uh, free skier as well, um, but the high school that he works at needed um, an alpine skiing coach, and they asked him, and he's like, "I've never ski raced in my life." Um, he goes, "I can build culture. I'll I'll create this great thing." Um, but I'm not a ski racer. And, and he was telling me the story when he set his first course. Um, you know, one of the parents who was like an Olympic skier came down. She's like, Andy, did you make that course? He's like, God, yeah, it was so hard. She goes, yeah, it's terrible. You can't use it, you know? And, and, and so he didn't have those tools, but he understood people. And he, he just won last year a state championship, right? In skiing, which he never did. So there's, there's both. Right. And again, knowledge of the sport is only one type of knowledge that's important. Um, knowledge of people and knowledge of yourselves means a lot. Now, high performance, provincial teams, national teams. Yeah, you got to know what you're talking about. Right. But um, early on, it, it's not as important. Um, and then I think having a high level of playing or participation experience is great. Um, and, but it's not sufficient. And for some people to walk into that locker room and, you know, you've been to two Olympics and done that and this, that's excellent, but that gets you in the door. It's what you do when you get there that keeps you engaging those athletes. And so um, at some point, you know, too many top players um, rely on, but I played and never work on their coaching game and, and that part of it. And, and they, you know, the, the, the examples of, former athletes who washed out pretty quickly as a coach is, is pretty extensive. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And that one really resonates with myself, John and Mohit. We can talk about it some other time if you ever want to. So um, I had the experience of being a, a higher performing athlete in two different sports and then becoming a national level coach in a different sport. So it's <laughs> totally that it's coming from the background and having knowledge of a sport, but knowing all of the coaching background uh, and being able to transfer that. So I know in my experience, for sure, you don't have to have <laughs> extensive competitive experience in the sport in which you choose to, to put your time and energy and learn about. That was the key for me. Mm. Um, we had some really great other questions submitted. So we'll jump into one of those and it goes back to becoming that early on coach. So coaching at a young age, what is one thing you would tell yourself as a young coach? And I know you kind of touched on this earlier on the getting to know yourself first. 
when you were first, first getting into coaching, um, what would you tell yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, I talked about that knowledge of self. And then the other thing that I, I wish that I realized before uh, earlier was the importance of culture the importance of team behaviors um, that sort of say, this is how we do things here. Um, because I grew up playing on some good teams, but culture was never intentionally done. Um, and what I, what you realize is sometimes if you have the right personalities, the culture gets take, takes care of itself. But what I would say is being intentional about culture, defining the core behaviors or values or whatever you want to call them um, is the key. And then intentionally teaching them and talking about them over and over and over that drives excellence over time, because what that does is it prevents us from sort of the, you know, falling back on our default behaviors or I'm not going to train hard today. So when we have these core values that, that, come out every day in training and they're defined and athletes have had some buy-in to what they are, then you hold them accountable for them. And you say, Hey, this is how we do things here. Would you like to change the values? Because we're not competing today. We're not very focused. So, but, and that's what you guys said you wanted. So apparently um, that's not what you want. So let's change them. No coach will fix it. Right. And now you're not yelling and screaming they're fixing it because it's what they asked for. And you're just reminding them of that. And so I wish someone told me that when I was starting out, that I had to be intentional about building my culture, about building the behaviors that the team uh, was going to be the bumpers of how we do things. Um, and if I had done that, um, you know, I, I had some very good teams. Uh, I had some teams with good culture and I had ones that had talent, but didn't achieve well because we didn't do that. And so now, especially in these last five, six years, uh, when I started coaching again, I'm super intentional about that. And if we get the behaviors right and we show up enough and do the right things day after day, we're going to get better. And if we get better, then we'll eventually probably win. Awesome. I love that message. Thank you so much. And thank you to Kirsty. She just posted a recording link of um, a session we did for coaches recently that many of you may have missed uh, on building culture. So if you want a little more information about that. Yeah. And let me, that. let me read a quote. Um, yeah, this please. was a really good quote that I uh, posted. Uh, it's from a guy named Al Smith from my fastest mile in the UK. And, it, and he said this, he said, this is the ultimate coaching paradox. The more we talk about learning stuff and the less we talk about winning stuff, the better we get at developing excellence and the more likely we are to win, right? So it's like the more we talk wow. about the culture and learning and not worry about winning, the more likely we are to be successful as well. And I think that's really well said. I really, really love that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, we have another good question that was submitted by someone. Um, that goes along a lot of the work that you've done. What are one or two things that you would suggest to better educate parents? Um, great question. I mean, first of all, just do something, <laughs> right? So like, don't just assume that they don't, I, I'm constantly amazed and even in my own world that when we don't provide information and we leave this vacuum, something's going to fill it. And in this day and age, um, it's not hard to find advice posing as expert advice that's actually very poor. Yeah. So um, you have to fill that knowledge gap because when you give them knowledge, then there's less fear. I think a lot of parents are just, they're afraid of missing out, right? They're afraid they're going to mess this up. And so if you are telling them, here's the pathway, um, here's what this looks like, here's be patient, Here's the whole journey. Don't just look at the week in front of you. I mean, we have a lot of parents freaking out right now because their kids haven't gotten to compete, right, for months or that it's getting cut back or they want to go to a university or an Olympics has been postponed or things like that, right? And, and, and so they're, they're scared. Um, and, and we have to say, okay, the journey is this 10, 12, 14 years long. That's the journey. Um, this month, is only a small part of it. So what, what can we control in this moment? So I think that's one thing. And then the second thing is just 
when, when they ask kids, like, what's your worst memory of sport? It's usually the ride home after. Um, and so if we can just teach parents that to let that time belong to their kids, if their son or daughter asks, how'd I do today? By all means, answer the question. If you're capable of answering it in a rational way and non-emotional way. But if you're upset, um, if you're angry for how they perform, not that they spit on someone or punch someone in the face, like deal with that, then, then just find a better time to talk about the game and let that car ride home be the time for them to physically and emotionally recover. Because if they lost, they're probably upset too. They don't need to hear it from you. Right. Um, and so I, I think that's it. If we, if we could create more psychological safety post competition, and uh, if we could have parents just relax and say the ups and downs and the wins and losses is all a beautiful part of the journey, we're going to be, you're, you're, you're 80% of the way there, I think. Oh yeah. And no cell phones yeah. in your room at night. That would help too. Oh, yeah. That's a good advice for all athletes and all parents to work and with their kids. Parents, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that one. Um, yeah, it's such a good message. And it's an important message that even myself as a parent now I struggle with, you know, the, your child gets in the car and you just you really badly want to ask how they like their session. So, or their, their, you know, their game or whatever. So being able to park that and give that child the, the chance to digest their own thoughts is so important, mm -hmm. but it's, it's mm -hmm. difficult. I'll share. Um, as a parent, I'm finding it far more difficult than I would have ever imagined. Yeah, it's easy on paper. It's tough, tough in the yeah. car and in reality. <laughs> well, yeah, because they're sitting back there and you're like, I just really want to talk about it. <laughs> well, well, you know what? Like I, 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 I mean, I, I wrote my first book and when my son was five and playing, you know, his first like youth soccer game and I was the coach and he walks on the field and he didn't want to play. Mm -hmm. And he walks off and week one, I'm like, ah, whatever, you know, we play the game and week two shows up, he goes to practice, goes to the second game and then says, no, I don't want to play again. And then I was angry. I was upset. Like he's like totally happy because he found like a lizard or something on the side. Right. And we get in the car and, and I turn around and I'm like, so TJ, what's going on? And my wife is just goes, bam. And I was like, why, what'd you do that for? She goes, didn't you write a book about this? Right. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that was me. Right. And so it's hard. It's super hard. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we have another great, great question. So we'll go off in a different uh, direction. The question from Nino is what type of literature do you read outside of the youth development sporting context that supports your own professional development within it? Mm, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, because I'm in, the change business, right? Trying to change behaviors or change the shift, the paradigm of youth sports. I've enjoyed quite a few books on that area. So uh, Chip and Dan Heath have a cool book called uh, Switch, um, which is how to change behavior when change is hard. Um, th that would be one that I read recently. Um, read a lot on leadership um and 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 building cultures whether in business or in sport so a lot of times you know you know it's funny i've seen some of like the best leadership people in the world give talks and they all talk about sports because that's something we can all relate to anyway um so you know i, I i've read that kind of stuff um i'm just fascinated by by what the successful cultures look like um and, and, and why did things work and, and do well? So I've read books about everything from Google to Southwest Airlines to, and everything in between. Um, but uh, yeah, and I've been reading a lot recently about um, communication because I think this is one of our greatest challenges as a coach or as a speaker is, uh, am I talking, but are they actually hearing and are they acting upon it? And so I am really interested in um, how people learn and stuff. I'm really, there's a, an author uh, in the US, he's a teacher educator named Doug Lamoff. And uh, his, he just released a brand new book. Um, and I think it's called um, like, best teaching practices for coaching or something like that. He's done a lot of work with us soccer, but it's basically like, what do we know about classrooms that make people effective teachers and shouldn't coaches know this, this as well. So I think that, yes, that's kind of a, a sport book, but it's pulling something from a different realm where they've invested billions and billions of dollars 
of um, of how to um, you know engage and communicate better. Um, well, I think as coaches, we should probably know that too. Totally. Yeah, I love that. And a follow up to that, where are you finding your best information right now? So we're in the business of finding great things for our coaches. And it's a bit of a, you know, is it best in sport right now or in business? And then I'm also seeing the emerging field of medical coaching. And there's more Mm -hmm. and more coming out of schools like the Harvard Medical School for coaching. Uh, Where are you finding the best information? I mean, everywhere. I'm very lucky that I'm in connection with a lot of different people and, and researchers. So um, this guy, Mark Williams from University of Utah, just released a fantastic book called The Best, How Elite Athletes Are Made. And he's one of the top people in the world in learning and skill acquisition. And he wrote this really nice, yeah, it's a popular science book along the lines of an outliers or something like that, which is good or peak um, and Mark falls along the lines of, you know, practice hours and nurture more than nature. Um, but he wrote a really nuanced book of sort of it depends, right? And his book covers everything from early specialization to birth order to where you're born, right? If you're born in sub-Saharan Africa, you're very unlikely to be a top snowboarder. Um, things like it's that. True. So what's in your windshield, um, the effect of coaching, the effect of choking, right? And, and the mental side of the game. It's just a really, really great review of the literature with some good things. So that was, that's the last book I just read. Um, okay. And uh, it just came out in North America, I think December 1st. And it's really good. There you go. Christmas idea for everyone on the line. Christmas sounds, idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sounds great. Um, and on that, we have another question that was just submitted. Are you going to publish another book? Well, I did one a year ago. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so that one uh, is, was sort of my opus for coaching, right? As I gave it to my editor and it was 300 pages, he's like, this is really long for nonfiction. I'm like, that's okay. I got to get it all out of me. And then I'll turn around and write maybe a shorter version at another time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there is an audio book, by the way. So if you just want to listen to it instead, but what I did, uh, so I'm working on a real short one right now, um, which is just how to coach youth soccer, um, because I feel like so many of them skip over the most important stuff, which is, you know, find your why and understand learning before you just are looking for sessions. So that'll be like a 50 pager. Um, But then Jerry Lynch and I are have in the planning stages, a book, um, which we feel is really needed in the sporting space that sort of goes along with our coaching work of how to be a great teammate, right? Mm. Like, you know, how, how do you, what does a great teammate look like? Someone who gives instead of gets and, you know, um, you know, epitomize a cultural architect and all these sort of things. I think that's for me a really, you know, important book that there's some stuff out there, but not, not a ton. Awesome. That's exciting. I can't wait to see what comes out of that. And, and the person who asked the question just posted and said, excellent. So <laughs> it sounds like uh, they're looking forward to it. And another person said, every moment matters. John's last book was amazing, very thought provoking. We just gifted this book to all the coaches in our volleyball club here in PEI. Oh, that is Yay. so cool. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So look, John, your, your <laughs> messages is being spread out across the large island of PEI. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. If, if, if you can tell them to, you know, give them my email and maybe when they read it all, I'll call in and do a little Q and A with their coaches. How about that? That would be amazing. I'm sure yeah. they would very much love that. Um, so we have lots of questions, which is great. So for everyone on the line, keep them coming because I'm just bouncing back and forth between what you're submitting. So this is exactly what we wanted. It's fantastic. Um, so we have one on coach education, which is a great one. So if you could change coach education, what's one thing you would add or change? Hmm. Uh, I think we've been kind of talking about a lot of the aspects of this straight through. Um, but what I think, and I quote a lot of people because but through the podcast, I get to just talk to fascinating people all the time. And so I'll quote, uh, or a paraphrase a guy named Wayne Goldsmith, who's a high performance coach from Australia. And Wayne says, um, you know, in all these other professions, right, if you're going to be a car mechanic, the first thing they teach you is what are the five most important parts about fixing a car? And you learn to change the oil and do this and do that and whatever. Um, 
in coaching education, if we ask our coaches, what's the five most important qualities of a great coach? Um, they're going to list things like caring and good communication and listening and being a good role model and being demanding, not demeaning, all these things that we've talked about. Um, and then he'll say, where's that in your coaching manual? It's not in there. And so what I would say is if I could change something about coach education, first and foremost, it would be this um, personal development, self-awareness piece. Um, and then, you know, let's understand learning, let's understand pedagogy and how to teach and then get into the sessions and all that, right? We, we, we talk right out the gate about, um, you know, tactical periodization and training plans and recovery and all this sciencey stuff. But ultimately, for me, the biggest statement that encompasses what coaching is, um, is, and this will be sort of the, um, the intro quote to my soccer book, nobody cares how much you know till they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we've heard and that that's quote. it. And if we all got that as coaches, we'd be far better off. That's true. Yeah, that, that yeah. rings so true. I love it. Thank you. That's great. Mm. Um, okay, the next one is quite long. So just bear with me and I can repeat if needed. There's a little bit okay. of background to it. Um, so this is from Derek. And he says, often when we hear of athletes leaving sport, the reference is to competitive sport. Do you have examples of any sports redefining themselves by focusing on joy of movement and connection to their body, nature, or others versus the winning base. So in the end, more top athletes would still emerge. So some examples he says are like hiking, running, skiing, cycling, skating, or pickup games. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's, it's great, right? And I think, you know, I, what that, Derek, what that question brings to mind is a couple of years ago, I was in Singapore and I was working for these international schools and they had a British Olympic swimmer who was the head of swimming. And, you know, so they had this really competitive swim team. Um, but what they realized was we have a lot of kids who want to swim, but they don't want to race, right? And he's like, why, why are when the kids turn 13, are we saying, if you won't swim six days a week, we don't have a spot for you. So luckily they had the pool and the facility that they created, you know, they, they had their swim team and then they created swimming two days a week, show up and swim and we'll give you some instruction. And he's like, we, we had like 120 people in that program. So we didn't lose them to the sport. We just gave them what they were looking for, which is, you know, I love this thing and I can do this my whole entire life, but I'm not going to give six days a week to it right now because I don't, that's not what I see for. And so sports like cycling, uh, skiing, skateboarding, uh, all these things are, are, are wonderful. And I think we, you know, we see like parkour and, and, and people just, you know, creating sporting environments that are self-directed learning or peer-directed learning versus coach-directed learning. It's why those have grown while traditional sports have, have gone down. Because let's face it, if they have YouTube, they don't necessarily need a coach in the moment, right? Like, oh, what's this trick? Uh, let me figure it out. Uh, let me ask my buddy who can do it. And that's far more enjoyable than being told by some adult, you're not doing it right, go run a lap. Um, and so, um, I, yeah, I, I think there's a great, I, I think traditional coaches can learn a lot from a skateboard park. Um, and I think we could also bring a lot to skateboarding in terms of respect for each other and, um, you know, take out some of the, you know, the bad elements as well that exists when there is no adult intervention. But I think we can, if you pay attention to how learning is taking place, I remember when my son, and he doesn't skateboard anymore, but when he first started, he's there around and some older kids came over and taught him how to do this and taught him how to do that, right? Um, and I thought that was pretty cool because I certainly would have got injured if I tried to teach him. Yeah, totally. It's a really, it's deep in the culture of skateboarding. And it's an interesting one as a sport like that now becomes an Olympic sport. And yeah. they're trying to come up with in Canada what their coach education looks like. And there's a lot of people who say, do they need a coach education? It is so peer directed. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch the evolution of that uh, move forward. And I mean, the snowboarding and free skiing movement went through that as well. And, and I think it did. 
we have a challenge that the idea that there's no room or role for a coach doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I've had professional surfers on my podcast talk about how having a great coach changed their surfing, right? And that's another sport that's very peer directed. So it oh, doesn't no. mean, you know, I, I think we have to be careful when people say, I don't need any coach certification. I already know how to do, you know, a 1080 backflip, like, great. That's not what we're going to teach you in coach education. We're going to teach you to keep your athletes safe. We're going to teach you to communicate. We're going to teach you to look for signs of if something's not right. It's probably not that they don't care. It's probably something else going on on their own life journey that is affecting it. And that's what I think if coaching education would be about that, we'd have a lot more acceptance. Yeah, totally. And we did see it. Um, Canada has a gold medalist, Mark McMorris, in, in snowboarding. And he was always one. He grew up without a coach. Um, he had a coach as a youth and then he he stopped for a while getting coaching. Then he did find someone and it was finding the right person even at the, uh, you know, he was a, a highly uh, acclaimed professional snowboard athlete. Yeah. But it was in his mind, he said, finding someone who was able to come out and film him and talk about it and have, you know, that reflection piece and just that person to have a relationship with and bounce something off of. And that is coaching. Yeah, that's so, coaching right there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's awesome even at the highest level. Yeah. Um, so you guys keep those questions coming. Just going to double check. Um, mm, actually, Sh Shannon, along this conversation has a just point. I see part of the problem being that funding is attached to winning. So trying to be competitive seems to take priority over just enjoying sport. Those who don't want to compete are looking for different avenues. Do you have mm -hmm. any comments on that? I, I mean, I think hey, you, you're exactly right. And this is, we've certainly seen this challenge very sadly here in the United States with USA Gymnastics, right? And that in, in the United States, um, there's no federal funding for any of the Olympic sports or any of the movement. It's like, go get sponsors, fund yourself. Well, no one's funding the ninth place team. So gymnastics became this thing where, you know, if we keep winning, um, we'll keep getting money. And so we'll turn a blind eye to certain things because we're winning. And we see where this came out with obviously the Larry Nasser stuff and also some very abusive coaching um, from, from the Carolis. And so it's really sort of sad. And, but I think you're exactly right. I think what sport governing bodies have to do is, you know, we need a certain level of funding that always goes to grassroots sport. Um, and, and we have to procure that in a way from our sponsors of like, Hey, you know, we understand that you want to be associated with us because we're winning, but understand that in order to keep winning, we need to invest in the growth of the sport because the more people there are skating, the more people there are curling, the more people there are sailing, the better chance we have of producing an Olympian uh, or, or an Olympic medalist. And so th this is this challenge that's always going to be the thing that drives our funding is not necessarily um, totally cohesive with what's our mission statement as a sport governing body. And it's a, it's a hard thing. It's a hard balance. I don't have a perfect answer for that one. No, I, w I will add for all of us here in Atlantic Canada, um, for you to know that if you look worldwide, we are very lucky here in that the bulk of our funding is focused on participation based um, sport. So it may be competitive sport, but at a very participation focused level um, compared to the percentage that goes towards what would be considered performance sport is very, very small. Um, mm -hmm. But I do know with some of our NSOs, so you go nationally again, they are more funded. Well, they're, they're heavily funded based on performance. So that mm -hmm. is a reality. But here in the Atlantic, we're very lucky that we have uh, there's not really sponsorship here, John, in Canada. There's uh, yeah. sports sponsorship isn't a thing, but uh, we have things like the Lotto who supports youth sports. So we're very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could learn a little bit from that, I think, in this country. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a little sponsorship and we'll give you a little education. <laughs> on the, no, there you have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Michelle has our next question. She said, I recently watched the Brett. Brett Ledbetter TEDx, Building Your Inner Coach with My Athletes. And we had a great discussion around his key points. Do you have any favorite TEDx or similar presentations aimed at youth that you would like to recommend? Hmm, great question. I wish, I wish, if I had that before, I could have probably prepared it a little bit better. 
Um, I mean, when I think of my role and, and influential TED Talks, um, I'll just talk three that maybe most of us have, have heard about. Um, the late Ken Robinson's talk on creativity um, and, and, and how um, our educational system squashes creativity. Um, and, you know, we're preparing kids, you know, the world's changing so fast. And what are, we're educating kids for a world that existed 50 years ago instead of what the world will look like 20 years from now. Um, and so how to do that better. Um, Simon Sinek's Start With Why is just a, a wonderful one. Um, and then I think Brene Brown, just vulnerability, um, that we're all on this journey and we all have a lot of you know baggage backstage. And so I think in coaching especially, there is, I grew up with these people that, you know, admitting that you were wrong or asking your athletes a question um, was a sign of weakness. Um, and I think it's one of the greatest signs of strength and, and, and being able to say, I screwed that up. That one's on me is one of the most powerful things you can ever do as a coach. And your athletes really resonate with that because when you're admitting that you're wrong and I'm trying to get better and I'm modeling getting better for them, they're more likely to say, well, coach is trying to make me better and, you know, he's messing up as well. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Message that's off the me. top of my head. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those. Um, and I think, yeah, Kirsty's going to include those links in a follow-up email. So thank you very much, Kirsty. That'll be helpful for everyone. Um, okay. Kirsty, thank you, by the way. Like I see you just like putting out links and books and, you're amazing. Well done. Yeah. yeah, she's she's helping a lot in the back end. So thank you very much. So you guys keep those questions coming. Kirsty is helping me uh, manage them. Make sure you put them into the Q&A because that's where we're managing what's been asked and what hasn't been asked. Um, so Sahid had a follow up on just the funding side of things. So he wanted to know your thoughts on uh, it says oftentimes performance performances need funding performances need for funding doesn't line up with the LTD. So I know in the States, you guys, yeah, you're aware of the long-term athlete development. Um, so his, yeah, his question is, what is your thoughts on the fact that performance needs don't always line up with the long-term athlete development model needs? I mean, I think that's true, right? And that's why in the United States, we have like AAU sponsoring a seven and under national basketball championship. That's not for the kids, it's for the adults, right? right? To say my kid went to nationals, like, give me a break. That kid still sleeps with a teddy bear, you know? And, and so it's like, uh, th this is where we really adultify youth sports sometimes. And, and this is where I think sport governing bodies really have a role in that if we can say, hey, there's not going to be a provincial championship or a national championship at 12 years old or whatever, right? Every sport is different. You'd need it at gymnastics. You don't necessarily need it in soccer. Um, but if we, this is where we can, because you can't, you know, coaches can't help themselves. Um, and, you know, if I heard this guy, Ross Tucker say, um, he said, you know, if we found out tomorrow and don't worry, I'm just making this up that coffee uh, before 11 AM shortens your life by 10 years, right? nine coffee shops would say, okay, we're not going to kill people. We're, uh, won't open till 11. And one would say, hell, what a business opportunity will open early and they get all the business. And so this is the problem is that as a governing body, if we can step in and help the people who can't help themselves, it, it's a huge thing. So like, USA Hockey did this with um, their American development model, got rid of checking um, before the age of 13, got rid of national championships, mandated cross ice hockey, all that. And everyone said, you're ruining the game. You're going to be uncompetitive. Well, um, they've done okay, right? They, they still are winning junior worlds and, and producing really more talented players than we ever did before um, because it, it didn't, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't, it was now based on what the kids needed. And so um, there's numerous examples of this Belgium soccer changed, you know, the first intro to soccer to 2v2. 
you know, and then kept the games really small. They let kids play down in age, not just up in age. So if you had a, a talented player who was physically, developmentally um, not, you know, a 15 year old, they would let him play down with the 14 year olds, mm-hmm. right? So he could play against his peers because we understand relative age and birth dates and how much that affects things, right? We look at a kid born in December and go, ah, she's not good. But if we change the cutoff date to November 1st, we'd be like, wow, she's exceptional, right? So a lot of countries have really looked at ways like until people are done growing, that's really when we know whether they'll be a high performing athlete or not. Um, let's keep them in the game. Let's create the best environment for them possible, you know, and having 11 year olds get, you know, decked by the 12 year old with a mustache and hockey isn't like super helpful to keep that 11 year old in. Um, So I I think this is, this is just, these are things, right. I'd say Belgium soccer, the English FA and soccer, um, small sided games, things like that can better align with what we need to learn. Um, and, and so the funding can come, what I would say the attachment to funding then is, um, let's fund organizations that do it right. Right. And let's highlight them. Let's give them something to stick on their website that says we're a model club because we do the right things here. Um, that would be good. And then when the person opens up the coffee shop at 6am next door, they don't get the put that thing on their website that says we're endorsed by, you know, the Atlantic's, you know, Canadian Atlantic sports center or hockey Canada or whatever it is. Right. Um, because we're not doing it right. Yeah. And I, I love your message and it's so great for, again, there's a lot of organizations on the call or coaches who are very influential within their organizations. You know, let's go back and change the structure of how things are done because until that changes, you're right. Coaches will coach to what's available to them and that's a reality and parents will put their kids in everything they have access to. So if we change what there's access to, which is what you're saying and, and how things are structured, then we will finally see the change that I think so many of us are looking for. Totally. So I love that. Um, okay. So I'm just bouncing to make sure I'm capturing everything. Okay. So another question we had for you coming from an Atlantic province, which most of us on the call are, we're coming from populations of less than a million and in some cases less than a quarter million, that big island of PEI I was referring to. So many coaches and athletes often have the small province mindset, which puts limitations on goals we have as coaches and athletes. How do you feel we can overcome this? Iceland. Iceland. Mm. Iceland soccer, right? Iceland, 300,000 people um, qualified for, uh, you know, went to the quarterfinals of um, the Euros, qualified for World Cup, you know, like just unbelievable. They have 300,000 people. Um, And so how do they do that, right? Like we have to stop making excuses about population. And I live in Oregon. Everyone in Oregon goes, oh, it's so we can't compete against California. They have more people. It's like, but we have 4 million people. Like we should be okay if we did it right. Um, And so I think that goes back to, again, you know, what's the science of athlete development? Let's put kids through the system with limited populations, countries that have been successful certainly um, share athletes, right? So it's this recognition that, you know, like you said, this great gymnast who won't necessarily be uh, an elite gymnast might be a phenomenal aerial skier, right? Or, or something like that. Um, it, but, you know, instead of complaining that we don't have enough, like, are we truly doing the best we can with what we have? which oftentimes we're not, right? And, and you know, Iceland, I mean, Norway in the last Winter Olympics, most medals ever. And again, what happens in the Norwegian system? I think something like, you know, 90% of their kids are involved in sport, um, you know, that's really low cost or no cost. Um, and they push off sort of elite select things until kids are 14, 15, 16 years old. So they, they, they push off talent selection as long as possible to let people grow and see their motivation and see how they develop um, and let relative age uh, ease off. So if I'm in a small population area, then I need the most kids possible 
playing my sport as long as possible. I want to create the best environment possible and I want to let them grow and then see, see what happens. But if you're going to go early talent identification, pull them out there, um, you're more likely to miss more than you get. Um, that's just what the, the research says. And then again, what has Iceland done well? Huge investment in coach education and putting some of their most talented and highly educated coaches with the youngest kids. That is one of my favorite messages. Hmm. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for answering that one. Um, so you guys on the call, we're getting down to the last question that I have here, and then we just had one perfect submitted. I'll start with that one. Um, but what I will say is as we get close to the end of our time, please, if you have something that you're sitting on that you'd like to ask, please post it now so I can make sure we can get through it uh, in the next little bit that we have. Again, a long one. Um, just let me have, okay, so a little bit of background and then a question. Okay, John, so again, if I need to repeat it, please tell me. Okay. Uh, this is from Paul with basketball, and he says, our philosophy for the Invictus and Warrior Games is that it is the start line that counts. The finish line ends the race, but it's by no, mean, by no means it ends the journey. Our focus is on competing and camaraderie and the experience. Other countries are coming to win medals, but they are seeing Canada as one of the happiest teams and, and there to embrace and finish first or last. So now other countries are starting to look at our model. How do you feel about putting the medals aside in the goal, but having the goal become the experience? Um, great question. I mean, I think, I think this is important, right? And, and it's finding the right balance. And that goes back to that, you know, it, coaching paradox of if we don't talk about winning and we just talk about learning and creating the right environment and, and part of that environment is like enjoyment and excitement and camaraderie and all these things and keep people want to show up day after day. And then when they show up, they compete hard. You're giving yourself a far better chance to win than if all you're doing is talking about, well, we got to win, we got to win, we got to win because you, can, you can't control winning. And, and when your focus is on that outcome, right, there's, you, you lose confidence um, because all the things that affect winning, the referee, the, 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 you know, the officials, the weather, um, the opponent, you could play your best basketball game ever and still not win. Um, and you could play your worst game ever and win, but that's not, you know, in development, it's gotta be like, well, you know, what's more important. So I think you, you have to know your audience and, you know, certainly, in some of these Northern European countries where they're very, and I think Canada is far closer to this than the United States is of like, Hey, you know, the, it's for the collective and it's for the enjoyment. Um, people get that. Right. I've been to Australia where like, they're like, hell no, that'll never fly over here if we can't keep standings. Um, and so you got to know your audience as well. Um, but you know, I, it just made me think of this story uh, I work with a NCAA division one top field hockey team. And um, this team, we had a transfer in from the number one team in the nation. And um, we were doing this thing this spring via zoom because of COVID and everything. And she said something to me that like blew my mind. Cause I've been with them two and a half years now about creating this culture and this camaraderie. And we haven't won a national championship yet, but we've had our two most successful seasons so far and our first NCAA tournament bid for 35 years. And we're doing well. And she said, um, she was coming from the number one team that won everything. And she said, when I looked to transfer, um, I watched videos of your post-game interviews and your team, and I told my parents, that's where I want to go, because that's what sport is supposed to feel like for me, and it doesn't feel like that right now. And she goes, and since I've been here, it's been 10 times better than I even thought it could be. And that, to me, was like the highest praise ever, because there's a kid who's a super competitive, talented athlete, but she still has that basic human need of wanting belonging and, and camaraderie and, and achieving something together. And so I, I think finding the balance of, yes, we wanna win, but the purpose why we're here is to create this amazing team and people who love basketball for life and, and not be in this hurry of being the best 11 year old team on the planet. Like that's not really the point. 
uh, short-sighted for sure. Thank you. So I've got another one here. Uh, again, that's a bit longer. So I'll give you the background and then ask the question. And Paul says, thanks, by the way, in the chat. Um, and then I'll say to the group, we probably have time. I'll read this one and then probably one or two more questions. So pop them in if, they're, if you're sitting on them, you are running out of time. So type them away. So this one's from Michelle. And it says, in sport, we compete to a degree for the same pool of athletes. While many recognize that multi-sport opportunity supports development of a better athlete, some sports actively work against it. And for your background, John, there's been a lot of work here in Nova Scotia on we want multi-sport athletes, we want multi-sport athletes, but is it happening? Uh, so for example, one sport might have a schedule that enables kids to do more than one type of activity. And then another says you can't be on the team unless you're at every practice. This causes some kids to have a move away from multi-sport. Have you had success in convincing sport organizations to support choices that enable the shared uh, athlete experience? Yeah, and it's it seems to be easier in smaller places where um, they have to share athletes, right? You go to a big city, you know, the people in LA don't care the soccer people don't care that lacrosse people need people They're like go find them. There's 10 million people here, you know? So, but what I've done with work with some, you know, towns where they set up a youth sports coalition and the main sports work together to say, we want to support multi-sport participation. Um, we want kids to develop as athletes first. How can we work together um, to, to find that happening? Um, and, you know, all it takes is, again, the one coffee shop that says, well, we're the real hockey club that doesn't let you do anything else. And you'll always have people who will jump ship. But I think it's really important that if you believe this, align yourself with other like-minded organizations and, and, and realize that you might not be for everybody, right? You're not going to please everybody because there's always someone looking for the all-in thing. Again, certain sports lend themselves on a performance pathway to multi-sport participation for longer than others, right? Um, you know, the more dynamic the sport, the soccer, the, the ice hockey, the things like that, the more hours they have to put in younger, but it doesn't mean that they can't do other stuff. And then I think you know, working with your coaches of, you know, how do you work with your athletes and, and understand this? So like what I do with my soccer players in a town where like, uh, you know, all these boys play basketball and baseball and we have a ski mountain and all this is I try to say, look, you know, you, you kind of sign up for a year round soccer club, but I ask for four, about four and a half months of the year where this is the priority, right? So from September 1st to November 15th and February 1st to May 1st, like this needs to be your thing. Any other time of the year, um, if we're doing something and you have a conflict, you get to go, you go to that. But by being part of this group, commit to my, commit to these four and a half months. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's not conflicts. And then we do our best to work around. Then I say, okay, I understand you can't make it. How will you make up that practice, right? Go with an older team, go with a different team, whatever. Um, and, and, and just work with them and, and call their other coaches and stuff like that. Um, that, you know, I, I mean, I've had, I've worked with athletes who have basically said, Hey, none of my other coaches will let me, um, back off can you please let me do it? And so I say, yeah, because that's good for the human being. Right. And, and her team has to understand that as well. And it, it's, it's a really hard thing, but sit in the same room, gather the people together and say, how can we work together at least till a certain age? And then a kid might pick lacrosse, a kid might pick soccer, a kid might pick basketball and we have to be okay with that. Um, but we shouldn't force them to pick when they're seven. No, definitely not. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask Nina, I'm going to ask your question now, and then I'm going to leave time for one more question after this one. So again, if you guys have a question, type it in. So Nina asks, do you have any advice for coaching athletes in high school where half your team is looking to play at the next level? So move on to university and the other half are just there for fun. How do you balance these two um, athletes? 
Yeah, that's that's always I think the biggest challenge, right? Is that when you have different levels of ability, but also different levels of uh, buy-in and uh, and different levels of goals. So here here's my advice, and having coached teams like that, is we still have a team culture, and this team culture. Um, is the behaviors that are, are non-negotiable. So we come up with that. And so whether you want to play in the university or just hanging out here to, with your friends in high school, if you want to be part of this team, this is still the non-negotiables for you that you have to work with. And so you got to show up on time. You got to compete hard. You got to be accountable. That's not anything else. Then, you know, I sit down with each kid and I get to know their goals and so when one says, I want to go and play on at the university, well, my expectations of him or her, the demands I place on them are different than the kid who says, you know what, I'm done after high school, but I want to be here because these are my buddies. And, and so that kid, I might be harder on in practice. I might say, are you showing up early? Are you staying late? What are you doing extra? Give more. And, and if they come to me and say, coach, you know, why are you being so hard on me? you know, Johnny over there, you know, he didn't do it. I'm like, yeah, and Johnny doesn't want to play in college, but you do. So all I'm doing is coaching you to the level you've asked me to. So what I would do coach is, is lay out your, um, you know, do that individual goal setting, see where they want to go, and then explain to your team, here's our culture. These are the non-negotiables for everyone. This is the basic minimum thing. For those of you who have higher aspirations right now, um, I'm going to ask more of you. I'm going to be a little harder because that's what you've asked for. And your teammates, if, as long as they meet the minimum requirement of, hey, we three days a week, we have practice. I'm not going to do anything on the other days. That's what they've agreed to do. Um, and so they do the non-negotiables, but, they, but I'm going to expect more of you. And does everyone understand why that is? And at any time, you can switch groups. <laughs> Say, I'd like to slide down here or, you know what, I'm ready to make the jump that's okay too. Um, I think that's the best way to handle it. Perfect. I think that was a great answer. Uh, yeah. And Nina says, thanks very much. That was super helpful. Okay. So we're going to close with one last question for you, John. Um, so the question comes around that age for requiring more commitment. So you'd, you'd mentioned, you know, don't make it the seven-year-old choose down to one sport, but this coach is asking what age is fair to ask for more commitment? I mean, I don't know. And maybe while I'm talking, you can type in, what do you mean by more commitment? Um, because that, that they can, you know, more commitment for a gymnast is 20 hours a week at nine years old, more commitment for a nine-year-old soccer player might be going from four to six hours. Right. So, um, it's a hard question to answer in a really broad thing, but I, I think middle school ages are definitely ages where kids start taking more ownership of the experience. Um, when they're younger than that, it's oftentimes parent driven. Um, and so at those ages where you're asking for more or, Hey, you're trying out for this team and this is the expectation. So I think laying out those expectations, I remember my, my daughter, um, played volleyball for a while and she tried out for this club that, um, said right on their website, our top team, and she wasn't going to make that team, thankfully, um, travels and gets on planes and goes all over the country for tournaments. And we do not have any promises that your child will even get in the game, right? So you can go fly to Las Vegas and she might not play the whole weekend. And so for me, when you're talking about 12-year-old volleyball players, that's just asinine. And it doesn't, it, it's, it's bad but at least they put it on their website. <laughs> like you couldn't argue with the fact that they were upfront. The problem is 90% of people um, say this and, and do that. And so um, I think by middle school, you can start asking for more. I think at always with younger kids, you can say, hey, what's going well? What do you need to work on, right? What's your plan to do that and, and help them get better? And then I think you can, um, and certainly, by you know high school ages, if you're on a on a high performance pathway, yeah, there's a certain level of commitment that you have to do to to be on this pathway. Especially if you're getting funding from your province, you know, from your province or from a governing body. Like, here's the funding. 
you're expected to do X, Y, and Z. If you don't do that, then someone else is going to take your spot. And there's always kids who athletically can get away with it for a while, but they're not going to get away with it forever. Totally. Yeah. And I'll uh, follow up because uh, Jolene's asking a few follow-ups, but Jolene, what I will do is ask you too, to um, go to your NSO's long-term athlete development model, because um, they, it should be part of, it's part of most of them that outlines when the requirement is to the point where it's maybe single sport. And for many of the sports, that's not until the athlete's almost an adult. Uh, mm -hmm. where you start to get down to say two sports. So a seasonal um, kind of focus on seasonal sport that can be around 14. Um, and there's been so much research in Canada on the athlete development matrix and what's required at what age to become, say, a performance athlete. So to ensure that that specialization isn't happening too early. So take a look at your own sports um, athlete development matrix and long-term athlete development model. And hopefully um, that'll give you a little bit of a specific answer for your own sport. Um, so what we wanted to do to close off, John, is ask you a difficult question to finish because um, we don't have much time. But the big question is during COVID, so we were shut down, then we were open to sport. We were fully open for a few months. We're now closed again, um, expected to open soon, then probably close again. So with all of this happening, how do we best support our athletes during this time? And what do you feel our role as coaches is? Mm. Such a great question. And it's so important because that ability to connect right now is the thing that they're missing, right? Because it's not just, you know, if sport is their only social outlet um, and now that's gone, um, we just have to connect. And I know when we talk about like physical abuse and emotional abuse, oftentimes school teachers are the first ones to see that. And um, now when kids aren't in school or they're only in school two days a week or something like that, that might be, uh, again, something that it's the coach who's going to catch it. So when you can't be on the field or on the court, it's, it's tempting in this moment to jump in and, and say, oh, let's turn our Zoom sessions into strength and conditioning sessions, which, okay, fair enough, you can do that once in a while but make sure that they're a connection, you know, connect them to your group. Why, why do you like being part of this team? When I went like 10 weeks where we couldn't practice here, I mean, we came up with our core values for the next year. Um, we, we, uh, and then we did this amazing thing. So if you, if you have a, like a two week lockdown, I, I highly recommend this from my friend, Trevor Reagan. It's called the untalent show. So every single one of us, including the coaches had to pick a skill that we could not do. Right. And it didn't have to be sports specific. So I learned, uh, I couldn't juggle, you know, with my hands. So I said, I'm going to take, here's me trying to juggle and the ball's bouncing everywhere. I'm like, in two weeks, I'm going to try to learn how to juggle. Everyone has to pick something. And these kids pick this. I mean, like three of them learned card tricks. Um, a couple others learned to juggle. They learned tricks on their bike or their scooter. One kid built a computer hard drive with his dad like they did all oh this goodness. stuff. And, and here's why it was beautiful. Number one, um, as a coach, it was really great for me to remember what it was like to learn something new. Because when's the last time you did that, right? And number two, to do it in front of the kids and have them laugh at me and watch me struggle um, while we're all laughing together, it's just a great connector of like, you know, look at coach, look at coach learning something new too. So I just, Take that, do that. If you get two weeks off here, turn your two week Zoom meetings into the Untalent Show. And uh, I think you'll have so much fun with it. Cool, that is such a great way for us to close, John. And just so that you know, yeah, we have at least one more week of sport lockdown across most of the Atlantic provinces, and then we get into holidays. So this might be a great time for many of us on the call to set something like this up because we have a few weeks of downtime, if not uh, no time uh, for, yeah. for sport. So perfect. Yeah, great way to end it. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us. I found this very valuable. Thank everyone on the call. Um, you guys were great. Lots of great questions and super great engagement. So um, yeah, I just really appreciate it. This is also closing our podium performance series for the fall and for all of 2020. So this is the year we've offered the most um, the most sessions. We've had the biggest attendance ever thanks to COVID. So uh, been a great 2020. And for all of you online, we're going to be posting our 2021 dates up until April uh, next week. So 
take a look back at the website for the next few months. But I think this was, we've ended on a really awesome highlight, John. So thank you. It's always fun to end in December on a, on a real positive note before the holiday. I hope so. Well, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. This was su super fun. And I mean, I do a lot of these and the questions here were fantastic. So thank you all for those. Yeah, I must say, I mean, I'm biased, but we have a really awesome community of coaches here. So I'm so proud <laughs> this of them. Was, this was great. A lot of times it's crickets. Oh, no, not, not with our group. They're very no. great. Like, I mean, we had a session last night, right? They're very engaged in what they Love do. It. So yeah, so thank you very much. We'll see all of you hopefully in the new year. Um, thanks for coming today. And you've got a whole bunch of messages coming in on the chat, John. I don't yeah, know I see them popping up here. Thank you all for the kind words. It was great. Yeah. Bye, guys.